uh, I think it's, it's rather difficult to sort of um, uh, boil down um, Polish history into a, a few sort of salient events, but, uh, but I can try. Uh, I, am, I should add I'm very much a modernist, so um, uh, my uh, knowledge of uh, medieval events is probably rather lacking. Um, but I would say certainly within that, and in spite of that caveat, I would say the Battle of Tannenberg, certainly. Uh, that needs to be in there. Probably the Battle of, uh, or the Defence of Vienna, 1683, is uh, a salient moment. Uh, and then coming into an area that's more my uh, area of specialism, I suppose we, we'd have to say the, uh, the partitions of Poland in the uh, 18th century. And then in response, the Risings, so 1830, 1863. Uh, and that brings us uh, neatly up to, I would say, the Polish-Soviet War, 1820. Um, World War II in, in general, but uh, certainly the Warsaw Rising within that. I think certainly uh, Monte Cassino, uh, and by extension the whole, the whole narrative of the Anders Army and the deportations. Um, and then coming right forward, uh, it's essential to look at solidarity and look at the fall of communism in 1989 to, uh, to understand where, how Poland gets to where it is today. Again, very difficult to define um, any, any sort of national, question of any sort of national identity. I suppose as an outsider you have at least some of a chance to do that with a degree of a degree of objectivity, rightly or wrongly. Um, I certainly see a, uh, I would say, a cussedness in the polls, which I think is a um, is a good word because it's kind of positive and negative at the same time. There's a sort of dogged independence of spirit and independence of mind, which I think is a, a, a tremendous trait to have. Uh, it makes those individuals difficult to govern of course, historically, but that's no bad thing. So I think, that's, again, I see that as a positive trait. Um, a definite charm, I think there's a tremendous charm um, in, the, in the Polish soul, as it were, alongside the cussedness. Um, and a, I think a pride in the nation and a pride in the, in the nation's history, again, which I see as tremendously positive. Uh, so I think, I think that those three probably, to me, are a, are, are a, a good combination, a good description of the Polish, the Polish character. Uh, the story of the Wadosh group is a, um, a really fascinating one in its own right. Um, it, it sort of delves into all sorts of areas of of, of espionage and these sort of um, you know covert network networks within within occupied Europe, um, it illustrates a really important aspect of the wider Holocaust history, the wider diplomatic history around the Holocaust. So all of this is important for us to to understand. Um, and crucially, I think it, it stands in its own right for. Um, the scale of the operation and the, and the number of people that uh, we know they saved. Um, we know that they, they produced um, around 10,000 or passports and documents for about 10,000 individuals. Of those, it's been estimated that um, around between two and 3,000 may have survived. We know that upwards of 850 did survive. Um, and these figures alone put the Wadosh group, you know, in the front rank of Holocaust rescuers. rescuers. So um, it stands in its own right in that context as a successful and ambitious and successful Holocaust rescue operation. But I think it shows us some more important aspects as well, as I say, the diplomacy, um, the, the complex and, and, you know, painful nature of, um, of Poland's history with the Holocaust as well, I think is illustrated in that. Um, so th th there's an awful lot there for, for the interested reader to, to engage with. Um, it's something I think that historians, uh, anyone involved in history professionally would, would 
bemoan the fact that you know it, appears, it always appears that the younger generation is not as interested in it as they might be uh, in what we tend to do. Um, that I think we have to accept before we start attributing blame. We have to accept that to a large extent um, an appreciation of history and an interest in history is something that comes to a large extent with age, um, with a sense of perspective in the individual themselves. And very often that takes time and that takes a degree of um, comfort in your own life, a degree of leisure that you can actually start to sit and think about such things and sit and read history books, for example. So. Um, to some extent, uh, interest in history is contingent on all of those things. Um, so um, I appreciate every historical museum ac across the planet is uh, desperately trying to chase uh, young people and make sure that they're interested in what they have to show. But uh, to, to, to some extent, uh, it always strikes me that might be a little bit of a fool's errand that, uh, you know, producing, producing materials for the uh, over 40s might be more beneficial. Um, so bearing all of that in mind, um, there is, I think, and this is particularly, a, I think, a Western European and maybe American phenomenon, um, the world seems to be sort of in a process of almost disavowing its collective history and particularly its national histories. It's certainly in a sort of convulsive process of reassessment, self-reassessment, of, of often a flagellatory self-reassessment, um, which uh, sometimes can be uh, beneficial, but I think often is not, and I think often is mischievous in its intentions. Um, so I think we have to look at the political motivations behind that, first of all, and be honest about them, uh, and combat them where necessary. Um, beyond that, uh, interest in history for me uh, came with a degree of maturity, it came with good teachers, um, it came with, uh, again, comparatively young. Uh, it came with a fascination in the modern world, primarily. Um, this was around 89 when I sort of had my great sort of, um, if you like, Damascene conversion. Um, I was fascinated by 89 in the sense that it showed me that nothing was essentially permanent, that, that what we had, had thought was so permanent, which was this you know, artificial division of the world and, and East and West and so on, um, which we'd assumed was permanent, suddenly, well, it appeared to be sudden, uh, was sort of swept away so quickly. Um, that awakened in me a, an interest and a desire to find out how all of that had happened in the first place. Um, so that was my sort of conversion, and then I went and studied, studied history and was very fortunate to have a number of really excellent, knowledgeable and crucially inspirational teachers, uh, most significantly among them Professor Norman Davies. So not everyone will have that benefit, of course, um, but um, hopefully, you know, history is strong enough, I think. History is strong enough, the stories are strong enough that um, if they're presented in the right way, they can be inspirational. Um, the problem, I suppose, is too often the way history is presented, again, I mean, particularly, uh, I think, um, British history teaching tends to be um, rather dry, rather utilitarian in a lot of its approaches. Um, it should not be forgotten that this is ultimately the story of human beings uh, and human emotions and human experiences. And that's something I, I do try and get across in my books as well, is to, is, to, is to not forget the human element, that that is a crucial part. That's essentially why most people will pick up the books and read them and keep reading them, is because they feel a human connection to the events described. So um, we have to remember that, both as historians and as teachers of history. And I think that's where a lot of that, um, uh, the, next, the, next, the inspiration of the next generation comes from. Uh, so it's a combination of all of those things, politics, teaching, uh, uh, let's hope that, um, that uh, you know, there's, a, there's another generation of, of good historians coming, coming, coming behind us. There are a few. I mean, I, I, I said I have um, a, lot of, a few favourite characters from the book. Um, I think Alexander Wadosh himself comes across quite strongly as a, as a very strong character albeit, um, you know, someone who is uh, perhaps less immediately physically dynamic than he might have been, 
as far as we can tell from the available accounts. Um, he was nonetheless someone who was uh, willing to stand up for the right thing and stand up for his principles and do something about it, crucially, which sets him apart from so many others uh, who were willing to, to close their eyes or avert their gaze. Uh, or even if they saw the, uh, the horrors, they, they weren't prepared to do anything about them. Um, he, he really was, and I think that's absolutely admirable. Um, so he's certainly someone, I think, that, that uh, stands out. Um, of the other characters, and there are many in the book, um, the one that always uh, used to bring a smile to my face, actually, which sounds peculiar given you know, the subject matter, but one of the um, uh, prisoners in Belsen as an exchange Jew uh, who's a Dutch Jew by the name of Louis Tass, uh, and he was then a teenager at the time. And um, he wrote, um, so he survived the war and wrote a, um, a memoir based on a diary that he was keeping, um, which was published under a pseudonym. Um, and I, I used to enjoy, I used to actually look forward to, to using that material because um, although he was... Um, you know, suffering in the most extraordinary way as an exchange Jew in Belsen for the last sort of year and a half of the war, um, what comes across from the diary very often was uh, that he was, to a large extent, just like every other teenager. So it, his, his sort of teenager nature um, sort of shone through. And that always used to sort of make me smile, that uh, you, can, you can take the, take the teenager uh, uh, um, out of their normal environment, but they're still a teenager. And that came across very strongly with his example. So I, I always had a soft spot for him when I was, uh, when I was writing the book.